This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 341 of the Stable Scoop Radio Show. It's the big and warm episode. Please support our sponsors as they make this show possible. Our sponsors this week are Cora Gem, By Me to Dewormers, and Flirting with the World. Welcome to the Stable Scoop, with weekly shows delivered right to you. With Helena and Glenn the Geek, live from the Stable, it's every week. They'll bring you the news through hail or hot water, while using their tails as their own fly swatters. So sit on down and laugh till your poop cause it's time again for Stable Scoop. Stable Scoop. Stable Scoop. Stable Scoop. I'm Glenda Geek. And I'm Helena B. And you're listening to the Stable Scoop Radio Show on the Horse Radio Network. Well, howdy, everybody. Welcome back to the show. Helena, you're in a little better mood this week, but your weather hasn't improved. Uh, I am not in a better mood. Oh. <laughs> not in a better mood. I'm miserable. Helena, I'm miserable. for the Horse Radio Network, represents all of everybody stuck in the icy, frigid Arctic. Um, of of the United States, and so you're sort of our representative because I think all our other hosts live in the where it's warmer. So well, although I, you know, I saw something that we posted. I don't know if it was horses in the morning or on Stable Scoop. We had a bunch of people write in wh- what the temperature was. Oh yes, you know, yes, yes. During that morning, we had a lot of Canadian people. Yes, we have a lot in. of Canadian listeners, and they've actually been a little bit warmer than you this year. So. I was going to say they're balmy <laughs> up there. They don't get as much wind as we get over here on the East Coast. We've been getting some serious wind, but no, I mean, I'm miserable is obviously the subjective term. I'm I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> Can't feel my right hand, but I'm fine. You, you've been having snow all day again. It's just never ending up there. Honestly, year. it's it's. Oh. We had a little bit of meltage because it got to be 35 degrees the day before yesterday. And it was just like, you could hear the angels singing above, you know, the sunlight hits the back of the house. The horses are all happy and it takes you only three hours like to do tease, the barns. Though, isn't it? It kind of teases you to what life could be, you know, or will be in another month. I don't even know. I'll tell you what. The tease is, I don't even want to know what my barnyard is going to look like when all that snow melts. Oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> There's going to be, the, it's going to be Menorah Palooza, I'll tell you. <laughs> and Mud Central, just mud. Oh. oh. And then you'll be in mud season for about a month. I don't know. It's not going to be good here until like Memorial Day. <laughs> Jennifer always said uh, when she lived in Massachusetts, I took my jacket off in July and put it on in August. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's what she always said about living in Massachusetts. She said, I want to live someplace where I can take my jacket off in June. <laughs> so it's yeah. I have to say it's been so I've been in Rhode Island now for five years and being two hours south of my previous home in, in Boston has made a big difference in the temperature we can take our jackets off in May there we can take go. our jackets off in May we don't have to put them on until Thanksgiving so that that 15 believe it or not it's a 10 to 15 degree difference all the time which is a big deal it makes a difference especially when you're getting When they get 36 inches of snow, we only get, you know, 18 inches of snow. Um, But, you know, Jen's right. You live in the Northeast, that window of opportunity for riding and being warm and happy and content, (laughs) peaceful and healthy is just small. (laughs) It is. Well, we have a big show planned for you today, literally. Um, There has been a picture making its way around Facebook of a Percheron, a black Percheron, who is just amazing in his family. And we have uh, have the person who owned that horse for many, many years and bred that horse. His name is Gerald Olibach from Windermere Farms. He's coming on a little bit later to talk about Moose, the Percheron. And you've probably seen the picture going around. It's of him and his family standing in front of a pine tree and uh, with this massive... Of Percheron uh, Stallion. We're going to learn all about Moose and the story behind the picture. And then we have Erin Gilmore coming on with us from Wellington with the Wellington Report. She is from Horse and Style Magazine. And she's going to, yeah, she's going to give us a report of Warren Wellington and what's every what's going on down there in all the show world. 
And then coming on later in the show, we're going to hear all about a company called Euclid. Uh, Euclid, and uh, with a girl by the name of Valerie Stern. She's going to tell us all about Euclid and what it is and uh, been around for a long time and how it developed. And we heard we talked to her at the Ada, the show the last time we were there, so we're going to hear about that in our Tack and Habit Habits segment coming up. I can't even talk today. Next week, we have something fun that uh, we were invited to. Jennifer and I are invited down to the Global Pet Expo, Helena, and it's in Orlando. I'd never heard of it, but our friends over at Pet Life Radio, who carry our shows at PetLifeRadio.com. Uh, we're the horse end of Pet Life Radio, and they carry dogs and cats and all kinds of animal stuff over there. And they invited us to come down. Uh, they're having a meeting of all the podcasters who do animal podcasts, and they wanted us to represent the horse world. So we're going to spend three days at the Global Pet Expo. It is one of the largest pet expos in the country, dealing in mainly dog and cat. Uh, hmm. They have 1,000 vendors there. 6,000 stores show up. Uh, it's a wholesale retail show. Uh, and they have 3,000 booths. It's huge. It's at the Orlando Convention Center. So we're looking forward to that. It'll be something different, you know, to, to, to see cat and pet and dog stuff down there. Yeah, we all, yeah. You know, all us horse people have dogs and cats, so it should be fun. We'll be doing Horses in the Morning there live on Friday morning. If you like our ADA coverage where, that we do all the time, you'll like this, only we'll be talking about dog and pet, new dog and pet items coming to the market. Uh, so that should be a, be a lot of fun, and, and we'll tell you all about what's what's been happening there. Uh, so that, that's coming up on, uh, next week on Horses in the Morning on Friday. So we, uh, we'll be doing that for you as well. And, uh, before we get started with this week's, uh, first guest, Aaron Gilmore from Horse and Style Magazine with the Wellington Report, we have to hear from our friends at Corrigen. <laughs> Monty Roberts has been using and talking about Coragem for four years now. Coragem is one of the leading suppliers of Brazilian killer bee propolis, both in liquid and cream. As horse owners, we want a topical product that provides superior results for girthage, saddle irritation, rain rot, and all fungal issues, even scratches and ringworm. Coragem does it all. We also want a product that heals wounds fast and minimizes the appearance of scars. Coragem does that too. And we wanted to regrow hair in affected area and reduce skin inflammation, and Coragem does that. Plus, it contains no steroids, antibiotics, or chloride. It is non-toxic. It's even safe when your horses lick it, and we know they will. Used and recommended by veterinarians, breeders, and trainers from all over. Get Coragem today at CoragemAnimals.com. That's C-O-R-I-G-E-M Animals.com. And use the coupon code HRN and 2015 that stands for horse radio network hrn 2015 and get 10% off your next order just because you're a listener to this show that's hrn 2015 at coragemanimals.com well, hi Aaron welcome back to the show Hi, thank you for having me. It's good to have you on again. Now, uh, we're, we're having you on for two reasons. One is that uh, Wellington's been going on for quite a while now down there in southern Florida. And uh, and we're actually going to be wrapping it up in the not-too-distant future, which means for everybody that's freezing in the north, summer is coming. Spring will be here before you know it. The <laughs> snow will melt. The temperatures will get above zero. And you'll be seeing palm trees blooming everywhere in the north. You lie. You <laughs> lie. Yeah. Palm trees are contagious around here. That's right. So we're going to send them up. I love palm trees. I right. have to tell you, whenever I go anywhere nice, it's palm trees that make it nice. That's how you know you're in the south. Is you know, especially if you fly into Orlando, right? Because they put the palm trees all along the airport just to make you, you know, make you wish that you were here all the time. It's well, just a welcome. I, yeah, there's yeah. a lot of palm trees down here. Palm trees get in my way when I'm taking pictures. Oh, that's I've, for uh, photographers. I've played a game this season where I've <laughs> I've framed my horses in palm trees this winter season in Florida. So. There you That's go. That's how many palm trees there are down here. <laughs> well, you know what else? I was surprised that we went to Wellington a couple weeks ago. Jennifer and I went down for a weekend, and we went over to we went over and watched show jumping, and then we also did dressage, and you know we we hit a bunch of things while we were there. The number of hedgerows, Helena, just the box hedges that they trim nice and neat. Yeah, they yeah. were everywhere. I mean, it made Newport look like they don't have hedges. Uh, <laughs> it, there were 
hedgerows. Well, for every hedgerow, there's a very fancy horse mansion behind it. That's why they need them all. <laughs> yes. To keep out the riffraff and, and to provide the nice background. So. And there's a couple <laughs> guys in a truck that are making a good living trimming them. Because they're all There's well trimmed. There's an army of guys in a truck. An <laughs> army of guys. You can see this place on a Monday. They all come in when the horses aren't being ridden. And you, you can't get anything else done because it's so loud. They're all trimming everything. Oh, Not that I'm complaining. No, Not it's beautiful. It is beautiful. Yeah, yeah, it is beautiful. And then we we did this. We went down to the ocean and we did the with the uh, whatever that road is that goes along the ocean through Palm Beach and down there. Um, mm-hmm. And we went down all the way down uh, to Del- Deltona Beach or whatever that is down below there, and uh, it was beautiful along there too. I mean, obviously Delray, 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 Delray Beach. Right? Yeah, we went to Delray yeah. Beach. That's right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was beautiful ride down there with with a bunch more of the hedgerows and palm trees. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and fifty million dollar homes. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. when you know you're in South Florida. Yep, that's right. <laughs> it was beautiful. Well, now there was there there is a actual riding going on down there now, and so give us kind of a Wellington update report of how the season's going. Last year in the jumping world, the British sort of dominated and took all the money home. Is that happening this year? That is not happening this year. No, uh, the number one rider in the world, show jumping rider Scott Brash, he has not been here this season, and. There's a lot of actual riding going on down here. I mean, we've got 12 weeks straight of this winter circuit, and this is week eight, if I'm not mistaken. So about around week eight, eight straight, straight weeks of course showing. It starts start to feel like eight years of course showing, but <laughs> there's a end on the horizon through the end of March. Um, this year has kind of been like the new crowd, and I say new crowd because it's not the normal British or maybe McLean Ward winning everything this year. Um, there's just been a bunch of different winners, actually. Everyone would know um, Georgina Bloomberg. Yep. She's she's been doing really well. She won a big Grand Prix for the first time on a Saturday night here. That was exciting. And Meredith Michaels Beerbomb just won last week. She's very, very famous in the horse world. But winning at WEF on a Saturday night was one thing that she hadn't done yet until last week. So made the classes uh, really exciting actually oh that's nice yeah yeah it's been it's been great and this week is the nation's cup so they have a big nation's cup that's explain that um, explain how that works uh it's 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 when you've got four riders on a team and you compete for your country and all the countries come with representation and they all compete against each other the cool thing that wellington does is they have these lower level children's and juniors and young rider nations cup teams so it gives a chance for kids to be on a team maybe for the first time ever and um, and ride a Nations Cup format. So it, it kind of means more when you're doing that and your score counts towards your team and you're not just riding for you and your horse, you know. So people really, really enjoy it. Helena, they take it very seriously, too. Let me tell you that the the uh, national pride goes to the extreme. The Irish actually yeah. uh, the Irish actually are armed and take over part of the corner of the arena. There's kind of this what are this the Historically, tiki hut? Yes, they have done yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. and uh, the they hut. yeah they take over the tiki hut. And guess what's in the tiki hut? At Irish tiki hut bar so they kind of take over the bar too <laughs> um yeah yeah that's exactly right so that's they have that whole corner go. over there to the yeah. <laughs> i don't care about horses i want to go just for that yeah that's they a were a little itself. pain last year so i i hope they bring it this year the big nation cup competition is tomorrow night who it's usually wins stuff. who usually wins uh well, last year canada won oh really and okay. canada's actually been in the top three for i think a few years of the recent years and canada's got ian miller who's Mr. Ten Time Olympian. They've got Eric Lamaz, the 2008 gold medal winner in show jumping. So Canada is always strong, but it's a Nations Cup that everybody always wants to win. So it's an interesting competition. Now, HITS is going on up here in Ocala, which is another circuit. Right. And they had a Nations Cup. Do you, do you know who won that? That was just a couple of weeks ago, right? I do. You know, I was up there. Ireland won that. Ireland's Ireland seems quite well. Actually. They're going to be drinking hearty at the next one. They're going to be. <laughs> uh, they, they might be. <laughs> they very well might be. Yeah, It'll, it, it should actually be a great competition tomorrow because Ireland is bringing not the exact same riders who are in Ocala, but a couple of the same ones. And they, they've just got a lot more Irish riders being based in the U.S. now. So they've got more talent to draw from, which is really exciting, I think. 
It's crazy. I don't think people realize. We, you know, we interviewed one of the Irish riders when we were down there. We did Horses in the Morning live from there, and mm-hmm. we interviewed one of the Irish riders whose name is slipping me right now. Uh, but when he, Helena, we asked him how many horses he has in training. He has 52. Woo! I yeah. know. It's incredible. They've got big operations. Oh. Oh, think of the God. Irish names. It was either Dara or Connor or... I'll have, I'll have to look it up and see who, who it was. But, yeah, I mean, just a number of horses that these professional, a lot of these professional trainers, now some of them don't only have, what, a couple, but there's a lot yeah. of them that have dozens, and it's just amazing. He has, like, 20 employees. I mean, Yeah, yeah well, you yeah. have a there's support staff. big operations down here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you, and it, because it's, you, it, uh, come on, it's a little bit easier down there because you can get more done. You've got you know, seven days a week, which you could do things. Maybe the rain might stop you or the excessive heat, but it's a lot easier to work around. Yeah, than but then the they pack it all up and where do you go next? I mean, after this season, they all pack up and go to New York or Kentucky, right? Well, you know, uh, it's a business. Depends. Yeah. They scatter a little bit. So they have, but they have, don't, don't they sort of take their infrastructure with them, Aaron, when they... Oh, of course, yeah. Yeah, they so, take their, their clients and their horses. They all, they all go to their other home base and it usually depends on... Um, a client usually owns a nice barn down here where they can base out of, and wherever that client is on in the summer season, they'll go there. Um, like Kevin Babington is on the East Coast, and uh, Derek Herons is as well. So no one is really here all year round, which is kind of sad to see all the empty horse mansions in the summer once they leave. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, a lot, lot of horses, and you can get a lot done. You can be a workaholic every day of the week. It's true. It's crazy how much the industry has grown down here. It's just a hub of activity at all times. I have to tell you, Helena, when we were there, you know Jennifer doesn't like big crowds, right? Uh, So we were there, and we were at the grounds almost all day. It is like a circus. There's like 20-some rings going. There's all the warm-up and the same number of warm-up rings going. And there's just people and activity and stuff everywhere. I don't know how you do that every day without just going nuts. It just is, it's insane, the amount of activity that's around you all the time. Well, you know, the interesting part is I think they've got 11 or 12 competition rings there, but um, there's a lot of, not a lot, there's a couple of other smaller school in-show circuits that are popping up around town in Wellington now, which speaks to how big the industry itself is just in Wellington. They can support maybe someone holding a show for 100 horses or 400 horses down the road, and that's been really fun to watch develop as well. That didn't even exist five years ago. So mm-hmm. you not only have the big, Winter Equestrian Festival, which is where everybody wants to be. But you've got a couple of choices now if you want to take a developing horse and maybe jump around somewhere else. Um, I've really been enjoying that a lot this year. What do you think is the um, the motivation or the, the, the catalyst behind the changes, the growth, um, in both the duration and the size of what's happening down in Wellington? Your winter well, weather is... Well, everybody <laughs> wants to be here. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. Your <laughs> I, weather, Helena. I, I used to feel... Sorry for me, it's 80 degrees today, and I, I'm sweating, so I'm having some trouble with that. But but it has to know. be good. I mean, they have to be doing something right and making it really absolutely. competitor friendly. It's, it's absolutely the best place to show a horse to get world ranking points. They have these five star classes this year, which is the top of the sport. I mean, there's no better place to be competitive in the winter. I truly believe. And, and the money. Uh, there's a lot of money. There's a lot too. of trickle down. Yep. yep. There's a lot of money down there yeah. in in, uh, in the and sport, too. And the dressage riders yeah. are coming in, too. I mean, it's not just jumping yeah. now. Now we have dressage not. on a big-time no, big dressage. dressage. Is great. Yeah. Uh, it's it, I, I'm a dressage fan, to, and that's going a long way to say that. But I, I will go to the dressage, and for, for three years ago, it didn't exist here. And now they're filling the stadium over at the dressage on a Friday night for freestyles and um, it really speaks to the demand in that discipline, too, which I think is, is so great to just see how that has grown from nothing in a relatively short time, too. So you've got a lot of dressage people here, too. And I want to give some love to Shane Sweetnam, because that's who we had on. Oh, uh, yeah, Shane Sweetnam. He's yeah. great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, uh, that's, that, he was the Irish guy that we had on that day, whose name I couldn't remember. Yeah. Well, you know what's really great about Shane Glenn? Yeah, yeah. He he works for a really big barn based in Kentucky, and of course they've got a big barn here. And he hired a young Irish guy named Lorcan Gallagher a couple of years ago, kind of as his assistant. And he's allowed Lorcan to get the rod on one of his good Grand Prix horses. And Lorcan rode in that Nations Cup in Ocala and won. And this is a kid who I think he's 20, maybe. And hmm. it was just such a nice 
thing to see that he's worked hard and he stepped up and she gave him that opportunity. That's awesome. Yeah. That's what I like to see in show jumping. Well, tell us a little bit about, uh, before we let you go, tell us a little bit about Horse and Style Magazine. Some some of our listeners may not be familiar with it, and uh, I get it now. You, you've been sending it up, and I love I reading. Have, I have. Yeah, thank you so much for that. I've been reading it, and I'm not a big magazine reader, but I like this one because it has great pictures. So, uh, <laughs> And a lot of that's thanks to you. So uh, uh, congratulations yeah, thank on you. that. Um, so, thank and, you. But the articles are good, too. I'll say that. Uh, but it's just it's different. It's a different different magazine so tell us i read it for the horse porn sorry that's right (laughs) (laughs) well we always try to have those pretty pictures in there for you guys so that's always important to us but it's it's equestrian lifestyle with a a strong focus on the hunter jumper industry so it's uh it's in print six times a year and we're online too at horsestylemag.com and it is it is different because we write about the things that interest us we write about fashion and the style world but also horse shows and kind of whatever strikes our fancy. So it keeps it really fun and interesting. I'm working on our April issue right now, and we've got a a great cover in the mix and a couple of really, really great stories I'm excited about. So it's a fun job, got to say. It's the first, Jennifer said, uh, my wife said, it's the first magazine that she's actually read cover to cover in probably 20 years. And she did. I, she <laughs> sat down with that. She read it cover to cover. And she she liked everything. And there's not too many magazines you can say that Should about. Can I write that one down? That's a good testimonial for Yes, it is. <laughs> and she'll, really good she'll write it down too. for you because she's picky. So, uh, But she actually really enjoyed it. And I think that that's a testament to the writers not writing above. You know, we're not hunter-jumper people. We you know we, we like it. We, we go to hunter-jumper shows, but we don't follow it. Um, uh, and right. and it's written for people who don't necessarily follow it, and and or if you do, it's good too. But anybody can pick it up and read it. Is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I write it so that anybody can and anybody wants to pick it up and be interested when they start reading a story. That's really important to me. And I, I'm not I'm 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 writing to the writers, of course, but but also to everyone. So it's just a it's just a fun, great magazine, and it just keeps growing. So it's. It's the best magazine, I'd say. I'd say to all your listeners, go online, subscribe, and you won't be sorry. And it's where, where and where can they find it? See, that's where Horse you're supposed and to put it. Like, Horse yeah. and Style Mag. 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 You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give it a shout out on flirting with the world too, because we really. We uh, flirting the world. We don't focus on equestrian style. We focus on general style. So I sure. think we'll um we'll, we're we're going to hook up some of our fans, our horse fans, and send them over to Horse and Style because you do a really good job. I love the culture part of it. Um, it's just it's a very well rounded. Like Glenn said, it's good for everybody. Um, but you really sort of weave in what's technical and important to the horse person in us, and then you know, then you gently massage that fun stuff like the culture and the style into it. So, um, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Send them, send them my way. Send them all my way. That yeah. We'll hook them up. Geez, Helena, you should be a writer. That was very elegant. The way you <laughs> yeah, said that. Very good. <laughs> Did you I write that down too? Uh, there, uh, Karen, you need to take that one down. <laughs> yeah. We, we, have, we just have the best fans ever. I love them. <laughs> Aaron, thank you so much for joining us from Worm Wellington. Uh, HorseandStyleMag.com is where you can find her. Well, we'll, why don't we check in with you again in about a month when the season wraps up? Absolutely. I'm going to have much more to talk about because we're going to look at our spring season. and We've got a lot going on. So, yeah, for sure. I can't wait to catch up with you again. All right. Thanks, Aaron. We all know the importance of deworming our horses, and Dr. Ellefson of Buy Me to Equine is helping us make sure we are doing it right. Listen for his four-part series the first week of every month on this very show. I just wanted to remind everyone, if you are due for deworming, why not save a few bucks on the popular Buy Me to line of wormers, including Equimax, Buy Mectin, Exodus, Exodus Multidose, and Equal. You can find coupons and special offers at buymediaequine.com, including a variety of rebate offers from cash to free ivermectin. You can also get up to $2 a dose back for Equimax. And while you're at Buy Me to Equine, get your free horse health record keeper, and you can just download it there. Plus, learn a bunch about parasites and deworming at Buy Me to, that's B-I-M-E-D-A, equine.com. We at the Horse Radio Network all use Buy Me to Dewormers because we want the best for our horses, and we know you want the best for yours, too. Buy Me to Equine.com and tell them the Horse Radio Network sent you. 
Coming up next is Gerald Allaback of Windermere Farms. He's going to be talking about moose. And as I mentioned, that picture that's been going around Facebook the last couple of days, if you've seen the big black percheron standing with his family uh, in, a, in a nice country setting, then that is the one we're talking about. Uh, moose is a, was one of the most incredible stallions and a world champion. Let's find out all about moose. Well, hi, Gerald. Welcome to the Stable Scoop Show. Hey, thanks for having us. We're glad to be here. Uh, my wife and I, Melissa and I, are, are really thrilled that, that you took time to call us today. Well, we could not call you because the picture of you and your family and Moose, the, the gargantuan Percheron, <laughs> uh, has been going around Facebook again. And I saw it maybe six months ago it made the rounds. But this time it has like 50,000 views and 5,000 comments. And, it's, and we'll post it in our show notes, too, and uh, over on our Facebook page. But it, it's just you and, and Moose, who is, a, who is a big black Percheron with, with a headlight. And, you know, he's just the most most attractive Percheron ever. And of course, I say that being a Percheron lover. They're my favorite breed. Yeah, every time you see a Percheron. I know. I I like big black Percherons. What can I say? (laughs) And we went to the Percheron Congress and we probably saw you and your horses there, although there were a ton of people there. Tell us a little bit about Windermere Farm and and when your love of Percheron started. Well, that's a a great story, really. Uh, My family came from near Philadelphia in a little town of Hatfield. Have you heard of Hatfield Meats? That's the town my, where my dad grew up. Um, it's all Mennonite family all the way up through. And uh, our heritage is, is all, of course, in German descent. And that being said, the city was growing up there, so dad really couldn't farm there. And it was just growing up around it. Uh, my grandpa, all about, in our German heritage, my grandfather's grandpa, just for that good information. But my grandpa, all about, had a, a mobile home park that he developed, and it it was the way he could make the most money there, and that's that's what they did. So in 1962, he helped my dad purchase our farm, which currently is Windermere Farms, and that's where Windermere Farms started in 1962. And in Pennsylvania, bit, it, in right Pennsylvania, in the center of Pennsylvania, we're only 20 miles from Penn State University. Ah, so it's it's a great hub. It's a great economic climate, um, truly our economy laughs in this area around that. We have a tremendous uh, Mennonite and Amish community here. Uh, many of our, our farms have been broken up and are, are now uh, smaller Amish uh, acreages. And a portion of our business now, we started as a dairy farm, um, we're currently a uh, complete operation of Percheron horses, and that is our sole living. Uh, we were the first to ship semen from heavy horses, so we developed the ship semen industry, and that's a huge portion of our income. Uh, another part is my wife does training, outside training for customers' horses. We even uh, have trained many different light horses, Frisians. She's trained, uh, currently has a Dutch harness horse in training. Um, now, is this all horses. driving, or is it riding, too? We typically do driving. Uh, we try to stay off their backs because our, our we, we definitely can ride, and we have trail riding in the mountains and so forth, but uh, our main thing is driving. That's what we specialize in, and we find we do better if we specialize. But, uh, yeah, the farm started here in 62. Another small bit of trivia is we do have the original deed, on this farm when it was land granted from Benjamin Franklin. And so it's very, very old historic farm with old, old bank barns, great buildings that, that we've worked and spent tremendous amounts of money to maintain and keep it their original. Um, so it's a great, great facilities there. Um, another thing we talk about the history and when we started in Pertrins, we had a Holstein dairy herd and, and I truly really loved horses. My dad did too, and he instilled that in me. Um, But we had standard bred race horses, Tennessee walking horses, saddlebreds, and hackneys. And as a young boy, I would go to the track with a a standard bred trainer. When I say young, I'm talking four years old. He'd go, I'd go with him. (laughs) It was kind of of like going with your granddad, you know, but he would turn me loose. At At about 30 miles an hour around the track. (laughs) Yeah. 
I, sometimes I'd get to sit on his lap and go for those rides, and it was quite a thrill. Yeah, I bet. What I learned, what I learned about it was that I was not going to be able to get a, a trainer's card until I was 18 years old, and that didn't excite me very much. So uh, I soon saw a pair of Percher mares, and my dad had kind of leaned towards towards purchasing Belgians before that. And uh, we we looked at this pair of Persian mares, and I was seven years old, and I'm like, Dad, that's what I want. And uh, so we came home, and we sold a couple of our milk cows that were kind of on their last legs and used that money for seed. And and some of our Persians today go back to that very, very first mare we bought in that team, back eight generations to that very first mare. So it's, I'm prejudiced. I think you, I think I like your taste better than your dad's, but I'm prejudiced. So I'm just saying. <laughs> well, he, he's a person guy through and through now. He was just, <laughs> there was another. There was another very. Good well, you know, every there. guy goes through the phase that they like the blonde girls. So yeah. you know, it happens, <laughs> right, Gerald? You could even turn. You could even turn a brunette blonde if that's your desire. <laughs> 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 My wife switches back and forth sometimes. <laughs> That's funny. Well, now but, you, let's let's uh, fast forward a little bit. I want to get up to the picture here, uh, and I don't want to run out of time before we talk about moose. Was was moose a horse that you bred? Yes, moose is is multi generational here as well. In fact, uh, his mother was for the longest time. Easily my favorite mare. See, our hitch was originally a gray hitch. Now we show we're one of the odd people. Like we're truly the only operation in the United States makes our complete living from Percheron horses. Um, but we we show as a breeder in the line classes. So we're showing stallions and mares, foals, you name it. But then we've also always had a hitch as well. And before mare hitches became popular. We were driving mares, but we were producing those mares in our own operation and driving out even against the gellings and successfully, like we were beating them. But at that point, we had a gray mare hitch, and his his mother was Windermere's tailor maid, and her name is M A I D because somebody else had a prefix tailor maid, so we couldn't use it the way you know we were originally thinking. But we made the female version. And she was my favorite mare. She was 18-3, 2,300-pound mare, big, beautiful mare. And she won many championships in hauled her, won in the hitch. Well, as she aged, she had a, a problem that, that ultimately was her demise. It, it was an abscess issue in a foot that we couldn't conquer. Well, you know what? And, um, let's talk about... I want to... Keep keep hold of your story there, but I want to mention that that is a problem that uh, we had with our Percherons as well, and it is something that the draft hordes breeds do see, and that is an abscess issue. Um, is that something that's getting better, or is it something that they're just always prone to that you're always battling? Well, we've had to breed for better and better feet and bottoms, and just because she had an abscess didn't mean she had a bad foot, but we have huge plattery feet, and. Some of the trends have asked for bigger and bigger feet, okay? The shoeing's not the issue, whatever, but they weren't breeding for depth of heel and true solidness of foot. Where in our breeding operation, we've constantly upgraded and bred for more depth of heel, um, but keeping a big wide foot. People are always looking at their feet. Why are they so big? Why are they, you know, well, they're a big horse, and so they need a big wide foot to spread that out. But this particular issue was just an oddball case. It was the only abscess I really had in ages. But it was a situation that was ultimately her demise, and she was pregnant for moose during this. And uh, we, she carried moose um, full term, and he was a great big baby. He was very simple looking when he was born, but we had five stud colts that year, and they all ran together through their two-year-old year, which is currently you know, that's how we do it. We run in herd groups. And uh, he was always my favorite, although he was the youngest of the bunch. The others were successful. We showed them. We sold them. They went on their way, and they've all been great horses for their owners. Um, that's another whole story. But Moose was my favorite of that bunch, and he was the one we were keeping back. And we didn't show him until he was uh, almost three years old. 
and uh, he won our state show that year. We showed him a little bit, and then we pulled his shoes, gave him some time off again, and then we didn't bring him out again until until his four-year-old year, and that's when he ultimately became the Supreme World Champion at uh, the 2010 World Pro Trim Congress. Wow. What was it about him that, that ha- what was that special something that brought him all the way up to world champion? What was his well, defining? You know, champion, a champion's not any one thing. A champion starts with your genetics and your breeding. And he came from a huge, awesome, cool, elegant, beautiful mare. And the, the head that they have is just a bit Roman nosed. And those horses in the Percham breed are almost always a little more bold, a little more dominant. It's got that war horse look that says, you know, I'm going to go out and conquer. And, and, and his mother had that, and he had that, and we, we just love that in him. Now, he also had an almost ridiculously long neck and very archy and shapely, and that was an extreme that held him above the rest. And those are the things, that great slope of shoulder and high head carriage, that's what most people noticed and, and said was his big defining thing. But in true reality, in our breeding program, we're breeding for an extremely long, flat level croup. We teach confirmation clinics truly around the world, and we we start back there because we're looking for overall balance of a horse, a long, slopey shoulder, creates a head carriage, then a short back equal to that shoulder in length, and then a very long hip from point of the hip to the point of the butt being the croup. And if those three parts are equal, or in his case where he was longer in the shoulder and longer in the croup, he was in the back, then you also have extreme motion, both front and hind. So mm-hmm. those are the things that brought him all the way. But the most important part of any horse, in my opinion, is their heart and their brain. And he had that. He had that beyond what What was his disposition had. like? I did get a question. This is something that uh, was brought up uh, by one of our listeners. And they said, you know, even doing these horses in hand and stuff, how do you keep them from accidentally killing you? I mean, they're just so big. And it, they said that their point was it would just be terrifying to show these things in hand and do the trots and running along and everything. And having owned Percherons that were big, not quite that big, but uh, that were big, I, it is, there are, were times I was, a, you know, we had the quiet ones. They, they were, he, they were extremely conscious of where you are. Uh, they yeah. didn't want to run you over. They didn't want to step on your foot. It happened occasionally by accident. Uh, but do you, is that something? That, are there some that scare you to this day? Or, there, or no, not? not at all. Okay. No, in fact, we develop, of course, you have to be fairly athletic. You can't be, you know, a, a person that's clumsy or, or out of shape and, and handle these horses in hand if they're going to perform to their best. But my wife does does the training here on our horses. And, of course, the in-hand training we're both doing basically all the time from the time they're born right on. But we develop a sense of their space and our space. And these horses, we never leave them crowd us or get in our space. Oh, you can't. Um, <laughs> Just... you know, and, I mean, we certainly show them affection, but you don't do that big go up and hug them around the chest and neck and lean on them and have them leaning back on you because all of a sudden that defies that that issue of your space and their space yeah um uh, yeah you when know, you my, got over a ton of horse that makes a difference i mean you really do yeah very important yeah. yeah but then you want to develop good handling techniques like you see us if you look in the pictures you've probably watched the youtube video uh, him mm-hmm. winning the world championship and you look in there and i always have a nice long stick and I use a, a broke off golf club because um, it looks a little better um, and it's long enough to be an extension of my arm. Not that I'm hitting them with it or anything like that, but it's kind of like a lion trainer with their whip. But they're using that as an extension of their arm, and that's what we do. Well, that's how you give and, them their aids, basically. You're giving them aids with that. Exactly. Uh, right. That's exactly what we're doing. Yeah. And so we developed that. We, we They learn to keep their head straight and focused. And he was just a big old soft baby. Like, I mean, <laughs> he could be laying in a stall and you could walk in and, and rub him and love on him and he will not even get up unless you ask him to because he, he totally, you know, like I said, my wife does all the training and she develops a trust with him. She's the best 
horse trainer I've ever seen in my life. And developing that trust between you. And then when you go and actually are in hand like you're talking about, it's just a matter of being in tune with the horse. And you'll very rarely see a picture of one of us leading one of our horses where we're not in step with them. So it's not like our foot's hitting the ground and a second later theirs is hitting the ground. I mean, that would be a, you know, a recipe for disaster. Um, and it's not like we work at it. It's just a matter of being in tune with your horse. Do you find so that they come with our, do they come with this natural rhythm or obviously horses do because they're horses, but, um, is that something that they pick up pretty quickly? Do they have a sense well, of your rhythm connecting with theirs or is that? Pick, that's more you picking up their rhythm and you being okay. in, in tune with them. Yep. And, and that's just a matter of just, just good horse sense. And, and like I said, you have to, you have to be a bit athletic to do this. It's not like, you know, well, you got to cover a lot of gr- more ground than they do with each step. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yep. they're, they're going to catch they're... up to you real quick. Now, you, yeah. yeah, you lost Moose a couple of years ago, I know, and uh, you know, I'm sure that was a very, very sad day. But Moose has prodigy. Are the prodigy looking promising? Absolutely, and it was sad to lose him. And we got you know sympathy cards from all over the world, and we've sold his offspring all over the world. Um, you know, South Africa, you name it, we've, we've, we've shipped them everywhere. But, uh, one of the great mares that we had bred over the years to our old stallion, which was Windermere's King Kong, famous in his own right, um, she had produced world champions herself from that meeting. And we had served her prior to Moose's death to, uh, produce what is now our junior world champion stallion at this 2014 World Congress, and his name is Bentley. And Bentley is hmm. by far, head and shoulders, the most promising son of Moose. And he's got a great mother, and, and she's here. She's 17 years old, and, uh, you know, we're really excited about that. And, of course, we have frozen semen on Moose yet, so we can make that mating again. Um, that's something we do hope to do at some point. I remember Bentley because if I remember right, uh, you had white and red in his mane. Um, Correct. And I remember oh. Bentley, and I just sent uh, Helena, I just sent you on Skype a uh, picture of Bentley. Yeah, hence uh, the gasp. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, Bentley is a Holy stunning, crap. stunning stallion. It really is. Wow. Uh, wow. How do you get him that funny. darn shiny? What magic of dust do you use to get him that shiny, by the way? Well, a company. Uh, approached us a number of years ago asking what we needed. And it, the company's Homestead Nutrition out of out of uh, New Holland, Pennsylvania. Don Weaver's the founder and great, great nutritionist, a great man. But he uh, he contacted us, and together we worked to develop a, a full line of products, and it's called Equally. And Equally products were produced by them initially in conjunction with us, and we worked very closely with our nutritionists. And uh, currently, I'm the national sales manager for them, so it's kind of funny you ask that. I didn't even know that, so I, I just, <laughs> just oh, saw how shiny you, he was. <laughs> you just opened the door. But <laughs> it, it, does start, it does start with uh, perfect, perfect uh, pedigree, and, and you absolutely have to have that great breeding in there. In fact, our horses are very much shorter haired than the average percher, and most of the time, if we're getting ready for a winter show, they don't even need to be blanketed. But that we top that great pedigree off uh, with great nutrition. Uh, we raise our own feed here, and huh. we, we also have a part of our business is we market hay, and we do that. You know, most most the East Coast and and uh, mostly here in Pennsylvania, but we have taken it to Ohio, uh, New, uh, North Carolina, you name it. We we moved it around, and so we sell great hay and this nutrition product from Equally. And you can look them up on Facebook and online too, but we're working now to develop a new dealer network and uh, we're, we're extending those products all over all over the country. We even have somebody contact us that's interested in, in stocking it clear in California. So it's, it's going to be nationwide here in uh, 2015. Well, you can find Gerald at Windermere. That's uh, W-I-N-D-E-R-M-E-R. 
R-E, farmpercherons.com. We'll put a link in our show notes and also on our Facebook page. Thank you so much for joining us and telling us the story of Moose and the story behind the picture. Uh, you'll be seeing Bentley in a, in a picture coming soon. That'll that'll make its way around Facebook, I think. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, it was a beautiful setting. It's just a beautiful shot of you and the family. And the pine tree in the back gave it perspective. Uh, yeah, so it was, uh, <laughs> it was, for Christmas. <laughs> My wife put on Facebook for our Christmas greeting that year. A local friend of ours, uh, Terry Hauser, just lives three miles from us, came and shot the picture, and it was actually 20 degrees below zero that day. <laughs> there oh, I know some about that. <laughs> yeah, yes. Helena lives in Rhode Island. She knows about that. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you so much, Gerald. We really appreciate it. Windermere Farms, Percherons.com. and Habit segment is sponsored by Flirting with the World, a life and style guide for the feminine spirit. This week we posted boots. Yes, bogs for horse people and regular people. Bogs we for horses? Product for bo- <laughs> bogs for horse people. Oh, okay. You're paying attention. Gotcha. Yes, we post all kinds of fun and interesting things um, from street style to farm style. Boots, clothing for men, women, a little bit about our passions, um, but we do product reviews, and of course, we tell you where you can buy those products. But just like here on Tack and Habit, we feature only things that we love. It's our creative outlet, and we hope to share that with you. If you get a little giggle out of it, all the better. Visit us online at flirtingwiththeworld.com. Hi, Glenn here, and I am at the American Equestrian Trade Association show. And my next guest I have with us today is from a company called Euclid. Her name is Valerie Stern. Hi, Valerie. How are you, Glenn? Good. So Euclid is probably a name that uh, a, a lot of my listeners haven't heard of yet. Tell us about it. Well, Euclid is a company that's been around for more than 50 years. It actually started when William Euclid Sr., um, who was a farmer in southeast Michigan, started experimenting with vitamin and mineral premixes for his cattle. And he quickly recognized that the cattle looked better. They had better muscle mass. They had more lustrous coats, both of which are signs of good health. They looked so much better the than... horses, right? I mean, right, they... <laughs> than, than animals that were just on straight forage. So he knew he had something there. And pretty soon word got out. Other farmers saw how great his cattle looked and said, hey, what are you doing? And before he knew it, he was in business as other farmers came to him and said, help us, you know, get the kind of results out of our cattle that you're getting. So that from there um, grew into this business. Um, and over the, the years, more than three generations of Euclid's have said, let's learn all we can about nutrition and, you know, help other people and help ourselves with our family provide products that really enhance the health of the animals and the people we love. So um, today, the company is owned by William Sr.'s grandson, Mike, and the company continues to invest a lot of resources in following nutrition, what's going on, what the scientists are finding out about the latest and greatest breakthroughs, and then bringing that in a really practical fashion to create products that really can make a difference for animals and for people. So are they still heavy into the livestock market as well, the cow, cattle and that side? or Over the years, the cattle business fell away. Um, before long, um, after a couple of decades um, feeding livestock, the uh, company was uh, brought into the equine arena, and quickly the horse people saw value in the products and came to them. And as the horse business grew, um, the livestock products, you know, fell by the wayside. So today we do still make products for other farmers, but the bulk of our business is going to focus around equine products, some small animal, especially canine products, and um, a growing segment of our business on the human side. Oh, wow. So now what kind of products do you have? I mean, give us an overview of what Euclid has product-wise. Well, um, we're the most well-known for our fatty acid product, coca soya. 
Um, that's been around for about Where'd 25 years. Um, well, I imagine it came from the blend of ingredients. It's a combination of coconut oil and soybean oil. Ah, coconut okay. soya. Got it. Okay. So, um, so most well known for that fatty acid product. But um, since then, the product line has evolved into joint products, um, calming products, immune support um, with antioxidant blends, um, and other herbal um, products that really do promote um, immune health, vitamin and mineral, general vitamin and mineral mixes, um, a lot of different areas. Um, and again, you know, taking those principles, understanding the nutritional needs of horses as herbivores, um, and then understanding what's different with carnivores um, and bringing those principles to canine products and human products. So tell us about the product we're going to talk about today. So I wanted to talk about coca soya, which is, like I said, our our big and most widely recognized product. And this is fascinating because, you know, um, 25 years ago when coca soya was introduced, nutritionists were just starting to recognize the, these omega fatty acids and starting to see some value in them. Well, Euclid started to experiment with these fatty acid, these oils that had fatty acids in them and found with, through tinkering um, a blend with the coconut oil and the soybean oil that really seemed to optimize the horse's health. Um, it really provided a, a great gloss and sheen um, that uh, was very beneficial for people that were showing. Um, folks that were had horses that had weight issues um, suddenly were finding that their horses were um, holding their weight, uh, gaining weight. Um, even horses that were overweight um, were suddenly able to, um, the owners were able to get the weight into a range that was, um, you know, more healthy for the horse. So, um, it, and I know hooves too, it, it, it tends to help hooves and hoof growth and, you know, that kind of thing. Yes. Yeah, yeah it does. And, and it's, the value of the product comes from the fact that, um, it's made with a cold pressed soybean oil, um, because it's cold pressed. Now what's cold pressed mean? So it means that there's no heat used in the processing and there's no chemicals used in the processing so they don't, to extract the oil They don't boil from it or steam it or, oil. yeah, yeah. Uh, exactly. Yeah. So you don't get any of the toxins that come with a chemical process. And of course, heat can um, break down nutrients in the process. So being cold pressed, you get the full value of the oil that's coming out. And when you of say cold soybean. press, you really mean pressing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So now, and I know they talk about on the human side, you know, you're supposed to have fish oil and all, which I, by the way, are awful, in my opinion. But, uh, you know, but it's the same concept, right, of the megas? It, it is. Yeah. And, um, and it brings in the full spectrum of omegas. You get the omega-6s, the omega-3s, and the omega-9 fatty acids, all of which provide unique benefits. But the soybean oil and the coconut oil in the the balance that we've come to with the proprietary blend really seems to optimize all of the levels of those three, six, and nine fatty acids for horses. You know, the one of the things that jumped out at me when I looked at uh, the product yesterday, and it's called again... Coca Soya. Coca Soya. <laughs> I'll never remember that. Uh, that. One of the things that jumped out at me was the price, because a lot of times companies that have uh, your, your competition, they just price these things out of this world, and yours was very reasonably priced. Well, and we've worked hard to keep the prices um, at a reasonable level. Um, the, the product uh, is uh, available in a lot of locations. Um, a lot of the uh, TAC and feed dealers across the country have it. It can be found at Tractor Supply as well. Um, so with availability um, brought widespread across the country. Now, does it do anything for like the, the, uh, the, you talked about the fat horses before, and of course there's horses that have insulin issues and sugar issues. Um, it, does it help in that way at all? Well, the beauty of the product is that the oils break down and metabolize more slowly than carbohydrate or sugar-oriented products. So oh, okay. it really helps to maintain a nice, healthy blood sugar level, which is so important for so many of these horses. Gotcha. Okay, very good. Where can people find out more about it? Um, they can visit 
www.equine.ukle.com, and Ukle is spelled U-C-K-E-L-E. U-C-K-E-L-E. Well, Helena, with all that shoveling you've been doing up there, you're, you must be getting some great guns and looking all buff. Ugh. No, my broken <laughs> wrist hurts. My back's all, I got scoliosis, I think now. And no, my jaw's locked. I got locked jaw. You know how we, no. we like the equity manure forks uh, and there's the shaking fork. We mm-hmm. need a shoveling fork, one that actually does the shoveling for you, you know, and, and you, you just sort of hold it and it goes down and scoops the snow and throws it for you. I guess that's a snowblower. I guess we do have one of those. It's a snowblower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. a snowblower. Uh, I have some. Do you have a snowblower? It's called Helena. Yeah. Oh, you're, you're going to own one though next year, and then you won't have any snow. If you buy one next year, you know you're not going to have any snow, right? That's it's... what Buck said. He's like, we're getting. Well, my uncle, I saw my family last weekend. I went to New York. My uncle's like, we got to find you a little, you know, snow plow for your John Deere. I'm like, my John Deere is a riding mower. It's not a field tractor. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you're not going to push much of that. <laughs> He's like, you can put attachments on it. And we do. I have a wagon attachment, and yeah. I have. Like yeah. one of those big, and you could push rollers. one or two inches of snow, but not, not eighty. <laughs> it's just you know that you're supposed to like bend and lift with your legs, yeah. not your yeah. back. But yeah. it, it just that's, that's fine for like the first twenty four inches. That's and then right. <laughs> you're like, screw it. I just got to get this done. Then you're like pushing it and shoveling and sort of shoving it up over the top. I mean, you're just doing anything you can to get it out of the way. Even the wood pile, the snow is so high that w- we can't even see the wood pile anymore. So <laughs> I need like, I, I just. At, at the I time need, of year when you're really supposed to be using the wood. <laughs> I can't, they need to make a pill for people in New England. Just a pill. Like here, it's the winter's over pill. <laughs> Go That's to what, sleep until May. And then I don't know if you've ever watched this show. Have you ever watched the show Buying Alaska? No. Oh, you need to watch it. You'll feel better about yourself. Um, so there's this show, Buying Alaska, and it's sort of like, you know, House Hunters, but in Alaska. And they show them going out to find these rural cabins where they have outhouses. I mean, this is Alaska. They get, you know, the kind of snow you're getting in, in three weeks, right? Every yeah. three weeks they get that kind of snow. And they go use the outhouse in it. And the, the, the outhouse is barely covered, but the wood pile has a nice, beautiful shed, you know, because they have to keep the, that's the only form of heat because they don't have plumbing in the house. They have to cart <laughs> their water from town in big tanks. And that's how uh, they take their showers and stuff. And it's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> that's pretty make... much what we got here. Yeah. Just saying. <laughs> it's what we got. <laughs> I can't imagine going to an outhouse with the bears in the middle of winter. Oh, God. We got bears here. You know, and I'm getting old. You know, that would be four times a night with the bears in the middle of winter <laughs> to the outhouse. It was like, no, not happening, not happening. And then they're paying $150,000 for these little cabins up there. It's like, are you kidding me? It'll make you That's... feel better about your lot in life, Alina. Just go watch, go watch Buying Alaska. It'll make you I, feel you better. Know, you know, I, I got my little shovel <laughs> and I say, I'm blessed to have a horse farm. I'm blessed to have a horse farm. I'm blessed to have a <laughs> There's a lot of other people that are saying that, too. I got to tell you, one of our listeners, uh, she's a very nice lady, lives in Maine. And you know the day, what was it, earlier this week? It was minus 20, right, or whatever it was. It was like minus 20. Yeah, I know the day. It was minus 20 real temperature and minus 40 wind chill. And Mm -hmm. she had to go to work, and she had to put her window down to go through the toll booth up there. She was like five minutes into her ride, and guess what happened? It's minus no 20. Way. You put your window down, it doesn't go back up, right? Oh, my God. So oh she had God. to drive the other 20 minutes to work in minus 20 degrees with her window down. <laughs> <gasps> oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> that, that's I'm not me. laughing at you. I'm laughing with you. We've all had that's stories funny. like that. It just we, we once broke down in the middle of a blizzard in Pennsylvania. We were t- two miles from home, and the car stopped at the bottom of a hill and we ended up it was nighttime it was about 10 o'clock at night it was really cold and it was a blizzard i mean blizzard and we had to walk those two miles i had pneumonia and a hernia and we walked those two miles <laughs> home and i thought i was gonna die i actually thought i was gonna die walking through the snow oh, uh, you could have i could have actually yes stuff happens and by the way i don't recommend having pneumonia at the same time you have a hernia it's not a good idea Coughing is awful. Just saying. Oh. So, anyway. All right. Now that we've t- all had our stories of woe, let's wrap up yeah. the show. <laughs> let's, let's wrap up the show. We should have called this the misery yeah, show. Yeah, I know. <laughs> 
<laughs> the misery. Misery meets moose. Yeah. Oh, that that's a better title. Let's change the title. Misery no, meets I moose. Like I, big and like... Warm. I like big and warm. I know you're trying to think of warm thoughts. I, I get Don't it. Don't be touching I my get big it. And warm. All right. Everybody knows where we, they can find us, right? Uh, do we have to go through all of that again? Let's just say goodbye. Stablescoop.com. That's Stable it. That's all you need. Uh, flirting with the world on Facebook. And thank you to our sponsors. We appreciate you very much. That's it for this week. Ah, we'll be back next week with more. Until then, happy scooping.